nearly 30 years in the tech industry as an analyst, futurist, consultant, strategy, blah, blah, blah. Last eight, nine years on smart cities and the future of energy and transport, etc., etc. And about three years ago, I made the foolish decision that I was bored with going to conferences and talking about it, and I'd actually like to do something. So I set up a non-profit uh, called Deliver Change Limited, which exists to harness technology to make urban environments healthier, more livable, and more economically productive. And our London initiative is called Change London. And we looked a couple of years ago and thought, what can we, what can we focus on? And to cut a very long story short, bubbling up to the top was the issue of air quality, which nobody was talking about two and a half years ago. Fortunately now, Everybody is talking about it, and you'll have noticed there's been quite a lot of media coverage, um, which is good timing for us. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you a little about it today. Hopefully, we'll have uh, time at the end for questions, because I've no idea who is in the audience and what your interest is. So uh, we'll see, won't we? What is the problem with air quality? And I want to thank, by the way, the organizers for putting this venue in one of the worst areas for air quality in London as I choked my way here this morning. Um, urban air quality is the top environmental risk factor for premature death in Europe. More people are killed prematurely by poor air quality than any other factor in Europe. And in the UK, that means 40,000 people a year whose lives are ended prematurely through cancer, heart disease, respiratory illnesses, and so on, uh, which is 10 times as many people are killed prematurely by road traffic accidents. It costs the economy in excess of 20 billion pounds a year and causes more days off work than industrial action in this country these days. Not sure about the 70s, probably the other way around, but these days it is a huge problem for business. It's a huge problem for the health service. 15% is the amount of lung capacity that children can permanently lose by growing up, by or going to school, by major roads with high levels of air pollution. And it also affects their cognitive abilities and many other uh, factors. Uh, small children are, in fact, disproportionately affected by air pollution. And 43% is what the State of Natural Capital report, which came out last month, uh, thinks will be the increase in road traffic by 2030. And road traffic in the UK, and particularly in London, is the primary source of pollution. That's the problem. So, uh, what to do about it? Um, this is what we're doing about it. Uh, part of the issue is we don't measure it very well. We don't measure it properly at all. The London, uh, London has a thing called the London Air Quality Network, which has about 70-odd permanent monitors. It's one of the better ones in the world. But what they do is they very accurately measure something that's not very interesting, which is the ambient air quality where that monitor happens to be. And then they try and interpolate what that means for air quality on a street-by-street -street basis, which is... Uh, a model and uh, not accurate. Uh, and we thought that, you know, there's a lovely quote from W. Edwards Deming, I don't know if you know it, um, which is, without data, you're just another person with an opinion. It's a, it's a lovely quote, and we think it's important. So our solution was to carpet bomb London with thousands of relatively low cost, scientifically accurate enough, but relatively low cost air quality monitors to be able to build a very rich, granular um, model uh, of air quality across the capital uh, with four key objectives in mind um, in no particular order first of all to provide accurate and user-friendly visualization uh, uh, planning applications for anybody who lives and works or spends time in London um, to be able to do things like low pollution travel planning like being able to track my daily exposure yada 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 who knows what else will come out of that um, but these things will be freely available to, to, to everybody um, secondly, to provide educational materials, and we actually have a charity in the group, the Deliver Change Educational Trust, which creates educational materials uh, for all schools in England and Wales around this issue, and we're also providing free air sensor equipment to every school in London and ultimately every school in an urban area in the UK, um, and they will be able to use the data from their environment within those educational materials to provide contextual learning opportunities, which is much more powerful from an educational point of view. Thirdly, to be able to provide free of charge very rich and deep granular data about air quality to policymakers and planners and TFL and people like that in London to help them to make the right decisions about uh, how to uh, address air quality. And lastly, to act as a platform for innovation through collaboration with other, comp with other companies, with 
universities and so on, not just around air quality, but about the whole issue of how you build high-density urban sensor arrays and what you do with them and how you, how, you, uh, how you manage them and so on. And when we started this project, you know, we looked at this thing, we, we thought well, everybody involved with Deliver Change comes from a commercial background. You know, none of us from a civil society or charity background. We all came to this and thought, you know, what we'll do is we'll build this big project and we'll take care of things like finance and business model and political stuff and, and, and platform software and blah, blah, blah and everything else and we'll just go and buy the sensors. Um, and it turns out that you can't do that because there isn't a market for low-cost air sensors, any that makes sense anywhere in the world. So we had to make our own. Um, and there are many reasons why no one has done this before. The single biggest air quality monitoring network anywhere in the world is in India, and it has 392 nodes. So by the end of May, we'll already be bigger than that this year. And there are many, many barriers for why this hasn't been done before. And you begin to learn as you go through them, that doing an IoT, and I am going to call this IoT, and we can argue about the meaning of IoT, because I was saying to someone just before we came in, that IoT now is a catch-all term for anything that you can imagine. Big data, M2M, blah, blah, blah. It's all become IoT, because that's the flavor of the moment. But this is an IoT application. And if you do IoT properly, it is actually a very hard thing to do, and it's almost nothing to do with the hardware. It's to do with these things. So sensor technology already mentioned. There weren't any sensors around that we needed uh, that, that would do what we wanted to do, so we had to make our own. Finding the sites, and we start to hit the first uh, non-technical issues here. Finding sites to put these things on. If you want to put 10,000 sensors in London, they're not very big. I'll show you one in a minute. But finding the sites and having them agree to give you uh, to, to give you the data from their site is not a technical issue. It is a political with a small p issue. It is having schools and businesses and so on say, I don't mind you measuring how bad the air quality is right outside where I am. And this is going to be true across all sorts of applications across smart cities and Internet of Things. It's not just about, you know, people talk about open data glibly. It's not easy to do. Uh, you have to be able to address uh, all, you know, the site's uh, concerns. Thirdly, the software platform. Software is at least five times as difficult and more complicated than the hardware involved. And I will talk about that in a teeny bit more detail. But a lot of what that's to do with is automation. Because if you're going to run many thousands of sensors uh, across a, a network, you need to be able to automate as much of it as possible because you need to be able to run it at a sensible cost. And again, I'll come back to that in a minute. Funding is an interesting issue. Hands up, everyone who's tried to get public funding for any project in the last year. How's it going? Going well? Excellent. Problem with air quality particularly, is most of the air quality projects that have been done in the last five or ten years have been in some, some degree publicly funded. And what happens is some money comes in, they run the project for two years, then they take it all down and put it in a cupboard because it's run by a university or whatever. Imperial College, one of our partners, Imperial College calls that stranded assets. They have dozens of stranded assets of government funded stuff over the years, not just in air quality, which now can't go any further because it's not funded. So we had to come up with a funding model which would last a long time because you need a network in place for many, many years, uh, which is why we're largely privately funded. And finding routes to market for that funding is a complicated option as well. And possibly the crux of the whole thing, I'll put them both up, political support. Again, for air quality, it's a very politically sensitive issue. So we've had 18 months of dancing around the table with the GLA uh, and with DEFRA and so on because... It's taken us that long to convince them that we're not actually a pressure group. Uh, we're not there to, make, to embarrass anybody or make anybody, uh, uh, make anybody look bad. We're there to provide a real picture of what air quality is doing. But data curation is what it comes down to, ultimately. And this is a really important issue, and I spend a lot of time talking about this with our partners, with other people, with the catapults, with whoever, because... Unless you've actually done projects like this or been involved in multiple data stream projects before, it doesn't become obvious until you get into it how important the issue of curation is. And I mean provenance, I mean reliability, I mean calibration, ability to understand where, you know, where the data comes from, the comparability and so on. There are, and you will find examples around the world of people who've tried to pull together a platform to get air quality data or other forms of data from pre-existing sensor networks and citizen science and all the rest of it. And they are nearly all 
crap because there is no idea whatsoever of the provenance of that data or how accurate it is. And we actually looked at one uh, about a month ago, um, a new one that had launched in the US, said they were bringing together 50,000 air quality monitors. And we picked on just one uh, in Boston and had a look. And it was reporting the temperature at that time to be minus 279 degrees centigrade, which I know, I know it's been cold in Boston, <laughs> but you know, less than absolute zero, probably not. And that's an extreme example, but I have, you have no idea when you, when you look at data from somebody else's network what that data means. So curation is absolutely core to this stuff. And this is what we end up with. This is an air sensor unit. It's about this big, about that wide, so the size of a small laptop. Uh, and it sits at three meters above the ground. Uh, they sit there looking like a Star Wars clone warrior helmet. Uh, we had to do something a bit more aesthetically interesting because when you try and talk to landlords, particularly like Canary Wharf, about putting them up, they're not going to put up some Dell grey box. They want something which has some uh, attractiveness to it. Uh, so that's what the unit actually looks like. And for those of you who are technically uh, minded, I've just done a couple of little pictures here. This is a basic layout of what is in, in one of these units. I'll point at this one. Uh, it's Arduino-based, uh, our own design data boards and all the rest of it has a battery in it because there are two versions. There's a powered version and a solar version. It has uh, sensors, optical particle counters, gas sensors, and various other sensors, uh, uh, atmospheric and so on. It has a GPS antenna and a GSM antenna because they all communicate via the mobile phone network back to our cloud platform. That's how they work, essentially, through the mobile phone network back to the software platform. And again, I'm sorry for giving you all this information, but I don't know what you're interested in, so uh, I'm doing the best I can to impart as much as possible. There are four fundamental parts to our software platform, um, which is built by a combination of MySQL, PHP, JavaScript, MongoDB, C, and Java, depending on what it is, uh, what the different bits are doing. And those four bits, although they are all on the same, roughly the same platform, they are optimized for the task that they are doing. So we have a state management, which is a bit that does all the automation. That not only looks after the sites and the contacts with the sites and so on, that also monitors every single communication from every single sensor to find out and compare with, its, uh, with the mesh and the grid and historical information to, to try and uh, discover when there is an issue with a sensor to, so it can automatically uh, line up um, uh, maintenance stuff and so on. And it can also communicate back automatically to get, for example, the solar units to change their sensing and communication regimes on the fly um, if, if they need to because they're not getting enough sunlight. Amazing in this country, I know, but occasionally there are times when we don't get enough sunlight. So it, the system moder um, moderates itself uh, completely, which is why it sort of qualifies as an IoT thing. Core data storage, at, at when we get 10,000 units in London, we're going to be pulling in 250 gigabytes of data a month. That's a very high um, capacity, uh, big data application, but it's very predictable. Uh, visualization and data API support, that's all the stuff where we connect to apps for consumers and to other applications where we're actually doing things to uh, working with partners to proactively lower air pollution, not just measure it, and a test and assembly platform for the whole uh, construction manufacturing exercise. Uh, I won't go into these in any detail because I've sort of talked about this. Uh, and that's what we're looking at, uh, Greater London, the 32 boroughs of Greater London and the City of London Corporation, and currently where we are, who is 55 seconds left, is we have a target of 10,000 units, two deployment options I've already talked about, powered and solar. They're going roughly a third, a third, a third on schools, on commercial buildings, and on other public infrastructure, um, which means the support of, of government and the boroughs is key for that last third uh, of, uh, of um, distribution. A schools uptake is rapid, unsurprisingly, because we're offering them free equipment, free educational materials, free stuff uh, um, all the way. We have 200 units dispatched already, 500 units by the end of May, which will make us the biggest air quality network in the world. And we're only 500 towards 10,000 units, and that's only Greater London. Here's a unit up on a building. It's that thing there. So it's, uh, we're trying not to add to visual pollution. Um, and after London, um, I say after London, we're already dealing with other parts of the country, because although we haven't done any press work at all, we have got um, quite a lot of interest from other places. There are 19 other urban areas that we're going to be addressing. Thank you very much.
Did that include? <laughs> does that include Q and A time? All right. So oh, excellent. Q and A now. Don't worry, we'll crack on with some questions. No Milton Keynes in there. That surprises me. Uh, well, Milton Keynes is actually technically <coughs> now part of Greater London. What? <laughs> <laughs> It depends where, who you're talking to, the city plans is on, but we are talking to Smart MK. Okay, right, good. Anyway. Good, good as me. Um, thank you very much for sharing that with us. A um, okay. couple of quick questions from me. Um, okay. I, I think you answered one of them. You've like 500 by the end of May, mm -hmm. 10,000, that, that's incredible. How long do you think it's going to take you to kind of reach that 10,000 mark? It's dependent on funding, not manufacturing, uh, because uh, <laughs> units are all manufactured in the UK, all from UK uh, derived parts. Uh, yep. We have no limit on, on how many we can manufacture. It's all about funding. We think it'll take about two and a half years. And my next question was going to be around funding, not-for-profit organisation, mm -hmm. applying for government stuff. What are your income streams? What, what, where, is the, where are you making this work as, as a business? Okay. Um, <coughs> we have uh, one or two private high net worth donors okay. um, who've uh, sponsored uh, some equipment on schools, some of the schools. So um, donors rather than in investors? They oh, there's no investors, there's no money to be made because it's non-profit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. um, we have um, corporate sponsors, there's a lot of corporate responsibility stuff going around this. So corporate uh, 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 sponsors and that goes right down to relatively small companies uh, that are run by people who've got kids in a local school and want to put, mm. they want to sponsor one on their kids' school. How much does one of these units cost? If I want to have one in my daughter's school? £2,000, okay. including first-year maintenance um, and comms and everything else. Yep. And then after that, it's £500 a year. So they, okay. that provides us with, frankly, a fat profit because, um, because they don't cost uh, 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 that much to make uh, because we're on a continual development path. You know, we've already, the ones we've already rolled out are version two units. Mm -hmm. By August, we'll be on to version three units, continually improving because we're working with our partners, include University of Cambridge, King's College London, Imperial, the National Physical Laboratory, um, uh, and a lot of technology partners uh, as well uh, in the UK. What's the lifetime so of one on. of these units? You know, you're talking about rapid development of them. How long before you need to replace the ones that you've already deployed? Well, the, the thing that actually drives the replacement more than anything is the electrochemical sensors go off over time. That's mm -hmm. why we charge £500 a year maintenance, because what happens is when the system flags one up and goes, that one needs changing, we send out another one that they just snap off, snap on, send the old one back, okay. we refurbish it. It's all part of the, of the it built into the costing. Good, responsible product lifecycle management. Absolutely. I like the sound of that, um, as we were talking about earlier on. Uh, yes, questions. We've got a question here. We've got a question back there. <coughs> a question over there as well, if we've got time. I'm just curious if you've looked at just simply placing these on all the cellular masks, uh, masks in the city. They're close together in the city. They're far apart in the rural areas. They're also in the, the government wrong place. licenses it. They should be able to make. make They're also in the wrong place. They have to be three meters off the ground, and cellular masks are almost always on the top of buildings. Uh, okay. So we we want to measure pollution where people are. What a shame. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we have lots of, uh, lots of government-owned property and, and, and other things where we've already agreed uh, site uh, placements and so on. So, Well, it's a thought. I'll send that back to our tech team. <laughs> uh, another question at the back over there. Uh, microphone is on its way. Um, I tell you what, um, yes, your, your bellow. Sorry. Aha. Okay, yeah, so what happens after this data has uh, emerged? Okay, uh, that's a very long, interesting, complex question. It is actually, of course, the point of doing it. Um, measurement is the first step towards change. One of the reasons that we don't change at the moment is that there isn't a political will to make the change. One of the ways in which you change the political will is by changing the view of people. So providing people with the information uh, will actually change the political equation and encourage... Um, the right regulatory changes. One of the things we've done over the last 20 years by pursuing the climate change agenda is push people down the low-carbon route, which is why this government's been so pro-diesel for so long. Diesel has at least 10 times as much carcinogenic air pollution produced as, as the equivalent amount of petrol. A little less carbon, a lot more uh, uh, other forms of air pollution. It's all been in the news in the last 48 hours with the motor manufacturers saying it's not true. It is true. Um, so one of the things we have to do is change the way that we regulate and we push people to change the mix of uh, fuels particularly, but other ways. That's the first thing. The second thing is um, we're already talking to a whole number of, of people about how we use this data, real-time available data, to actually make proactive change. So one of the things we can do is we can communicate with hybrid vehicles. 
particularly buses at the moment, but ultimately any hybrid or electrical uh, uh, vehicle, um, so that the vehicle will know when it's reaching a pollution hotspot and will automatically switch into electric only mode if that's available. So we can actually uh, even out air pollution because it's the hotspots which cause the most damage. Uh, we're also talking to people like air conditioning manufacturers because at the moment large buildings have air conditioning and filtration units. That all takes quite a lot of power mm. and uh, they don't actually need to be filtering at least half the time we can give them real-time information about when they need to switch in and out of filtration. So there's quite a lot of energy saving. Energy saving leads ultimately to pollution reduction. There are a number of examples of how we're going to use real-time data <coughs> to actually create uh, better air quality. Terrific. Thank you very much indeed for the question. Very quickly, question there and question there. Yes, sir. Hello. Uh, how do you address the fear? Say you install one outside my office mm -hmm. and I find out we have terrible air quality now that's going to be really bad for my employees mm -hmm. from for my company how do you address that fear and what do you do about it because it's a risk <coughs> right? well the answer is of course we're not actually making the air quality bad we're just letting you know about it which gives you an opportunity <coughs> to do something about it a lot of the companies one of the first companies that signed up with us was hearst magazine uh, hearst publishing the people they produce cosmo and and other mm -hmm. magazines like that one of the things they wanted to do was specifically to engage their employees as part of their uh, sustainability and uh, environmental strategy to let them know on a daily basis when there are going to be pollution events uh, so they can know how to avoid them uh, and at least you know, sort of try not to spend a lot of time standing outside chatting for an hour when you've got a high pollution event uh, you know, right outside your building and so on. Um, the fact is you can already tell when there is poor air quality. Um, this is going to enable us to be much more accurate about it and therefore to be able to engage people and avoid it uh, more effectively. Terrific. Uh, two more very, very quick questions. Yeah. Yes, please, madam. Yeah, uh, hi. Uh, green vegetation tends to lodge very useful. One question about the product design yep. and the bill of materials for the actual appliance itself. Yep. Could you tell us why the cost is so high in steel and uh, why the what was the reason to, I mean, was it, did you look at other kind of suppliers or did you wanted to build this in the UK specifically? What was your thinking around the cost? <coughs> well, uh, there, is lots of, there are lots of air quality uh, products in the market that cost about $100 at the moment. They are unadulterated crap. So air quality egg, all the rest of it, massively inaccurate, utterly pointless, and actually make the, the, the situation worse. We need to be at least scientifically accurate enough to be acceptable, which is why we're working with those universities and others, uh, and we'll have a, a DEFRA accreditation uh, before that long on the unit, because otherwise people will have no faith in the data and do nothing with it. And that's particularly true if you're actually trying to create some kind of political will change, because as soon as people can point out and go, well, that data is rubbish, then you've, you might as well pack up and go home. So they have to be good enough. Within that, there are sensors, and particularly... Do you remember in the, well, you won't remember, but in the middle there was a little thing called the OPC, called the optical particle counter. That uh, tracks particulates, PM10, PM2.5, PM1, that's microns by the way. 1 and 2.5, the carcinogenic particulates, and particularly our output of diesel engines uh, and so on. Uh, we need to be able to track those accurately. That unit in and of itself is £250, just that one unit, and it's the first unit ever that costs less than £700 to be able to do this. So we're at the bleeding edge in using this, this brand new bit of technology. But once you've put that, you put the electrochem sensors in, you've built the data board, you've put <coughs> in all the other bits and pieces, you end up with a unit which costs several hundred pounds. Um, it's still about 25% of the cost of the next cheapest equivalent piece of equipment anywhere right. in the world. So okay. we've cut 75% of the cost. The reason, we, as I said, we charge more for it is because uh, we need to continue development, we need to run the, the organisation and so on. Terrific. Thank you. Garbage in, garbage out. It costs to have value. I would say one last thing I would, I would leave you with is generally in the Internet of Things, the thing to remember is people talk about a tsunami of data. 99% of the data that the IoT in general will produce will be rubbish. 99% of what's left will be usable in relatively small circumstances and siloed. The 0.01% of the rest of the data that you, you understand the provenance, the accuracy, you can mash it up, you can do useful things with it, will be fantastically valuable. We don't know what the 0.01% is yet, but ultimately there are going to be the Googles and Facebooks of the IoT. Mm. And I hope that some people in this audience are, are, are on that track right now. I'm afraid we are going to have to move on. I'm ever so sorry. Uh, make sure you do grab Jonathan afterwards. Um, Jonathan, terrific presentation. Obviously, uh, has uh, inspired quite a few questions there. Thank you very much indeed. One more time, please, Thank for you. Jonathan Steele. <laughs>